it may go all the way down to the subatomic level that there's this built in mechanism that we express and we, we talk about it as desire. Uh, but it, it actually looks a lot more fundamental to me than, than a word like desire. Can this is real interesting. Now, I don't know how much it, it, as a, a matter of content, if your show kind of goes into the, the deeply esoteric, but we can, we can, that's a rabbit hole. I'd dive in real quick. Sure. Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot. So, so one of the ways that I, that I've thought about it, and this is, I'm, I'm basically just applying a framework that I've used in the past that seems like it might roughly fit, um, not to overcode the, the, the domain we're at, but maybe to get some, some directions, maybe get some orientation on it, is this is a distinction that, that I've made between what, I'm, what I call the rivalrous and the anti-rivalrous, um, which maps roughly to atoms and bits, as it turns out. Um, which, by the way, we should be very clear, the third term here, which we might consider energy to be a, a, a process or a dynamic between the two. Um, so atoms, bits, and energy feels like that's a pretty solid uh, constellation. And you know, the characteristic of the rivalrous is, the, is, the, is, is rivalry, a desire, competitive desire. The fact that at the end of the day, there are certain aspects of the physical universe, of which physics is largely the thing, the branch of science that studies that universe. Um, that are, are at the bottom strictly not uh, shareable, both in the sense that they are atomic, meaning that it, if you have it, I don't have it mm -hmm. in some sense, uh, and, 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 and tropic, meaning that, that to the degree to which you interact with it in any way, you, you turn the free energy into entropy, uh, you've depleted it permanently in a one-way direction. So there are certain aspects of the universe, the things that are studied by physics, that have those characteristics. And around those aspects, you would imagine that they would evolve, for example, a, as a fundamental characteristic of any uh, system that, sorry, I have to back up. There's another component here which has to do with the irreducible necessity of the ability to accumulate an upgradient of that particular scarce, fundamental scarce aspect of reality in order to perpetuate dissipative systems, right? So we have another thing here, which I think you just channeled there for a second. I see that. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was a people say that. You might think yeah. I, was, I was trying to think real deep. Oh yeah, no, that's good. Uh, uh, the way, this is actually a secret, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a synesthete and I don't actually think in words. Um, and so when I'm doing that, what I'm actually doing is trying to hold a particular, I, I kind of refer to it as a geometry, but it's almost a little bit more like, you ever seen those puzzles that are a 3D puzzle, but you're looking at it on a computer screen, so it's 2D? Right, yeah. You have to rotate it and orient it until the 3D system pops and you see the 3D model? Yeah. It's a little bit like that. Like I'm actually moving things in some, I don't know, some interior good, space. Yeah. That, uh, but once it locks, then I have to hold it because it's not easy to hold. But once I hold it, then I have to start figuring out how to pull the words out that right. the words map to the thing. But the thing's the thing. Um, and that may very well be what's referred to as channeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that little bit right there was a nice chunk of stuff. I'm, I'm reasonably confident. And um, okay, so you've got that. You've got dissipative systems and you've got the, the reality that there's essentially a binary in dissipative systems, which is to say that either they are what Deloise would call heicities, uh, you might make a simpler term would be ephemeral, like okay. a, uh, a Sirocco or a little breeze, you know, it comes around and, and it goes away and sort of evaporates. And then the, there are others that have a capacity to pull resources from their external environment, which now by definition are going to be rivalrous resources, to perpetuate their being what they are, a, a pattern that has the capacity to repeat itself over time. And I'm pulling a lot of, uh, right now, a lot of Deloitte's, uh, and to a lesser extent, a lot into that. So, you know, and this, by the way, I had this conversation with Brett Weinstein uh, about 12 years ago. We kind of were discussing ethics. We got down to the very bottom, which is, okay, we can, we can make a proposition that we have a, have a habit of thought, which is based on a simple survivor's bias. We happen to be the leading edge of a 13.7 billion year survivor's bias of those set, that tiny subset of all possible phenomena 
that didn't just evaporate back into the quantum foam. Um, and then, you know, so then started getting atoms and the atoms became molecules and didn't evaporate back into the atomic, you know, uh, maelstrom and the molecules became organic molecules didn't just evaporate back right so that structural development where's this we have the survivor's bias of that and you know kind of channel a little bit of jordan peterson here if you plug him into that structure you're like yeah and the narratives and mythopoetics and ethos and values that we happen to have sitting you know that we sit on top of are an expression of that entire arc um, of which now we can plug uh, mimetic desire is a real deep piece of that, which probably mm -hmm. goes all the way down to the struggle between um, uh, quarks to be the ones that actually turn into atoms, um, right, right there at that pivot point between to be and not to be, or to continue to be, to become on in becoming, or to become nothingness again, is probably the the pivot point. Um, and if you anchor there and pull all the way back out and can hold continuity from the quantum foam all the way up to you know, complex cultures, I think then you've got a very fair frame to actually start really talking about uh, the Girardian insight. But to remember that you're holding that piece of reality, which is the piece of reality that's talking about the rivalrous, talking about these characteristics of, of the th sorts of things that physics studies. But then we have to talk about the, the other side, which has to do with um, creativity, emergence. And this is where Eric and I have still never yet finished out, figured out how to figure out our knife fight. Um, and Brett, I think, sits in the, in the middle of it because he, at the end of the day, as an evolutionary theorist, cannot dispense with the notion of, of, of evolution. He cannot dispense with the notion that there is, in fact, change, that the, that the, the, the sort of Newtonian, or not Newtonian, the, I call the simple Einsteinian model of a all at once static space time continuum, you know, the, the notion that there is, in fact, no novelty, that, that all has, in some sense, happen instantaneously and that to the degree to which we perceive change, it's an illusion. Um, from an evolutionary theory perspective, that isn't a good, uh, a good model. Right? An evolutionary mm -hmm. theorist has to have at least some notion that you can actually, you actually can go from zero to one. Mm -hmm. You can go from what is to an entirely novel in some, in time, some kind of actual novelty, like innovation, novation exists as a part of ontology. Well, okay, that's the other piece, right? Novation cannot be strictly rivalrous because at, right. at the very beginning, you're literally going from zero to one. You are, in fact, creating moreness. Um, that piece is the piece that is not fully captured in um, purely mimetic desire because you, you're actually creating something new. There is no copy there. So that would be the other, the other piece that I would layer in to get a fully rich uh, theory. That so includes, you've got things... You've got, you've got things like scarcity and then this idea of maybe post-scarcity here, or this idea, like I'm thinking of the um, the biblical story of Jesus when he's handing out the fishes and loaves and he takes these fishes and loaves, but they just keep coming. He doesn't yeah. cut He doesn't cut the fish up into pieces. All right, everybody get a little out, little meat here. No, he's just like, nope. And it's this, this declaration of war against scarcity, right? Yes. And it doesn't right. require it doesn't require coercion to do. He doesn't he doesn't say, "All right, I've, I'm forcing you to give me your food." He just the you know, voluntary exchange, and from that voluntary exchange, there's this renunciation of the confining power of scarcity, right? Well, I mean, I, that's I, creativity I, without conflict, right? That's create that, that it's that's creativity, that's generativity, and as you notice, there's a whole bunch of characteristics. Like if you think about that particular uh, parable there's a, a mentality, there's a, a premise, there's a commitment to peace, for example. And you, you can't, in fact, have generativity outside of peace. Peace is the space which gives rise to the possibility of true collaboration. Uh, once you've achieved peace, you then have achieved the sh capacity to shift from a scarcity dynamic to an abundance dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, pl plenitude as a secondary artifact. And I'm, I'm making that distinction. So. Um, I think, of, I think of there being a, a, a scarcity mentality. In a, in, attached to the scarcity mentality, and we can actually use, have shifting to the mythopoetic, I would tag the character of Mammon. Mm -hmm. so, so Mammon is what happens when you operate with the scarcity mentality, but multiply by grotesquerie. So uh, you know, the Jabba the Hutt character. Jabba the Hutt is, has, has uh, too much but still is tied to a scarcity mentality and is trying to plug the hole of scarcity through getting more. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the wrong answer. 
Then you got another thing over here, which we can talk about uh, Jesus in the, in the parable, which is to say, no, we're actually going to move into the abundance mentality. We're going to move into a space that is anchored in a fundamental sense of orienting towards this other domain, the domain of creativity, the domain of generativity, the domain, domain of novation, which or, first and foremost has to be held in a space of peace. But once we're in that space, we recognize that we're now in a place, a place of plenitude, which doesn't necessarily even vaguely look like Job of the Hut, right? It actually looks nothing at all like that. Right. It's like a whole bunch of people who have actually have to be conscious of the fact that to maintain the integrity of peace is the first thing you have to do. That's the beginning. If you can't maintain the integrity of peace, then the whole plenitude evaporates. And so therefore, each of us as an individual has to start taking responsibility for only taking that piece of the peace that is ours and to carry the cross that is ours to carry fully and completely to maintain the integrity of that. You know, that thing is the most sacred, the most sacrosanct. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I think I would have found a bit of a tirade there. No, but it's this idea that you don't have to divide up the pieces that you have, that you can take what you have and through voluntary sharing, you can, uh, you can alleviate the, the pressures of a scarce world. That You've got a yep. whole crowd here who's hungry. Who's going to get fed first? That's the question you'd immediately think. Is it going to be the uh, apostles, or is it going to be those who are richest in the crowd, who have fast passes to Disney World? Who's it going to be? And uh, this issue is not resolved by saying, okay, let's, let's ration out what we have. We've got a basket of fish and loaves. Somehow in that moment of voluntary sharing, scarcity is just overcome. It's just, yep. it's the scarcity is just thrown out the window as if it doesn't actually bind up the universe after all. Well, know? it's a lot of powerful stuff in there too, because if you think about it, there's a moment, there's a choice. And a big part of that choice has to do with fear. You know, if, you, if you're able to, to choose in the face of fear, because at that moment there's a, hey, who's going to get the scarce fish and loaves? Mm -hmm. And maybe if I'm, if I'm fearful, if I allow fear to be my, my basis of choice, then I'll, I'll struggle to be the one who either A, gets it, or even better, gets to be the one who makes the determination. I want to be the boss. If there's going to be a boss, I want to be the boss. I just don't want to be the boss's crony. Um, and you have to get past that. You have to find a way to get past that, that uh, as the basis of choice. And it's a very, this is a very nuanced thing I'm saying. Right. I don't mean be foolhardy. I don't mean numb yourself to the reality of the possibility of privation. What I mean is to not allow that to be the basis of your choice, to go deeper than that, not to, 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 to ignore it, but actually to recognize that it's a real thing. It's a fundamental thing. It's a part of reality, but it's not the fun, most fundamental part of reality. Below that, deeper than that, is that sense of, well, in this particular parable would be love, which is deeper than fear. And if you can anchor in that, then you begin to recognize that, oh, oh, if we voluntarily associate in this space of peace, we can in fact get past this problem, this necessity to begin competing with who's going to be the boss and who's going to be the crony of the boss. And most importantly, who's going to eat and who's not going to eat. And it has always been thus, right? So if you think about it as a, as a narrative of the human experience, it's just trying to remind us of the fact that, when we move ourselves into a mindset of scarcity, when we move our, are moved from a basis of fear, we may believe that we have solved a problem, but we in fact have bitten off the biggest problem of all, which will inev inevitably end now. Now we're in Gerard land. We've, we've anchored ourselves deeply in Gerard land. And we know how that story ends. Um, and therefore, we must always be mindful of the necessity of choosing not to go there, the necessity of choosing even when it is at its most challenging to be anchored in that sense of love, to create the space of peace, to voluntarily associate. And from there is the only path that leads us into a good future.